difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid. We praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid, we praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid. We praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. Hello. I am Ladaris Cordell, the host of Make the Call, a program that wants you to do just that. Pick up the phone and make the call. one 888 Murder zero, one eight 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 six eight seven three three seven zero. Pick up the phone and make the call and give information to help solve homicides in East Palo Alto. In this our third installment of Make the Call, we will first bring you the profiles of two more murder victims. You will hear from their family members and you will learn about their tragic deaths. In the second half of the program, we will have a conversation with members of the faith community of East Palo Alto, and we will hear what the faith community is doing to reduce the violence in East Palo Alto. Over the last 15 years, approximately 100 homicides have occurred in East Palo Alto, and only half of those murders have been solved. This means that there are 50 people out there who have gotten away with murder. That's not right, and you all know that that's not right. So we have Make the Call because we want to bring these people to justice. That's what Make the Call is all about. Our first victim profile is that of William Sandoval. Detective Angel Sanchez with the East Palo Alto Police Department is here to provide background on this homicide. On March 20th, 2009, officers from the East Palo Alto Police Department responded to the 2200 block of Addison Street for reports of shots fired. Officers arrived on scene and located a victim in the driveway of the residence, later identified as William Sandoval. Mr. Sandoval had been shot multiple times and died at the scene. At this point, we have minimal information as to who the suspects are. We know that the suspects fled in a vehicle, and at this point, they, are remain, they remain outstanding. Thank you. So here to talk to us about William Sandoval, to tell us what kind of a person he was, are his family members. We have with us today his wife, Margarita Sandoval. We have his daughter, Jocelyn Sandoval. And we have his mother, Senora Linda Sandoval. Thank you all for being here with us. And working as an interpreter, assisting us, is uh, Patricia Neme. And thank you very much for assisting us in interpreting for Senora Sandoval and for Margarita. You're welcome. Thank you for having me here. So thank you all first for joining us on Make Gracias the Call. Por estar aquí. You're welcome. Yeah. And let, let me say, though, that, that we have always had as guests adult members of the family and adult friends of the, uh, the victims. Today, Jocelyn is with us, and she is 11 years old. Uh, she is here because she insisted upon participating in this program. She wanted to be here to talk about her dad. So with her mother's permission, Jocelyn has joined us. And Jocelyn, I think it's very brave of you to be here. So thank you. You're welcome. So let me start first with, with a question to uh, Senora Sandoval and to Margarita. Um, how did you find out about William's death? Margarita, ¿cómo se enteró de la muerte de su esposo William? Uh, yo estaba doblando ropa en la casa cuando alguien llamó a la puerta, tocó. I was doing some laundry at home when somebody knocked the door at home. Um, él dice si estaba mi esposo adentro y yo le dije no. 
Entonces yo corrí para afuera, no sé ni por qué, porque no me habían dicho lo que había pasado. They were asking for my husband, and um, I answered that my husband wasn't at home. So suddenly I felt that I needed to run outside without knowing why. I started running outside the house. Corrí y, y mucha gente miré y no lo miraba a él, preguntaba por él y gritaba, y preguntaba. And I saw y my house surrounded of people, and I couldn't find him, and I was asking around. Uh, where was my husband? Where is my husband? Um, nadie me contestaba, nomás se me quedaban mirando y cuando yo miré para el suelo vi que estaba él. So nobody answered where my husband was and when uh, everybody was looking at me with um, astonishment and when I look at the floor I saw my husband lying down on the floor. I, um, know, th I know this is very hard for you yeah. and, 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 and if you can just tell us Anything else you want to tell us about that moment when you saw him? Yo sé que esto es muy difícil para usted, pero si usted nos puede explicar qué más pasó en ese momento. Cuando yo este llegué y lo vi que estaba tirado en el suelo, uh, yo no quería levantar y mi suegra iba detrás de mí corriendo. También. So when I saw he was lying in the floor, I wanted just to pick him up and hug him, and my mother-in-law was following me. Uh, yo me levanté y yo gritaba y pedí ayuda. So I saw that everybody was looking, but there was nobody, no, no doctors, nothing. So I reacted quickly and I got my cell phone and I called the ambulance to come and help us. Señora Sandoval, I know this is muy difícil, but can you tell us how you learned about your son's death? Señora, ¿usted cómo se enteró de la muerte de su hijo? Lo mismo que estaba yo ahí, yo abrí la puerta cuando llegó él. I was, persona y dijo que había una balacera allá abajito y que si estaba ahí mi hijo. I was the one who actually opened the door when they knocked at home and they were looking for my son and then we found him dead in the floor. And Jocelyn, how did you find out about your dad? Well, I heard my mom screamed and so I went running to, towards her and then I saw him on the floor and I ran to, towards him and I was saying, Dad, are you okay? Are you okay, Dad? He didn't answer. And Margarita, were you pregnant at the time? Margarita, estaba yes. usted embarazada? Sí. Sí, me faltaban 22 días para que la bebé naciera cuando él lo mataron. When he, when he died, um, 22 days after that day, I gave birth to my daughter. And what is your daughter's name? Uh, Catherine Pilar. Catherine. What will you tell your daughter about her dad? ¿Qué le va a decir usted a su hija cuando crezca sobre su, su esposo? Pues que era el mejor padre que ella pudo haber tenido, aunque no lo estuvo con él, pero yo siempre le voy a hablar bonito de él porque es lo que es para ella siempre. I'm going to tell my daughter that that was the best father she could have had because he was expecting her with love, although she will never meet him. Right. That was the best father she could have had. Jocelyn, you have a birthday coming up, right? Yeah. And you're not going to have a birthday party. No. Why, why is that? Well, because every year we celebrate my birthday. Right. But now this year we can't because he's not with me and I'm going to be sad. I understand we have photographs of William. And uh, as these photographs are shown to our audience, we'll be able to see them here. And I'd like you all, if you can, to tell us who is in the photographs, and maybe what's happening in the photographs and when they were taken. Vamos a ver una foto, si por favor, si podemos hablar sobre esa foto. So, is that William? Sí, yeah. Okay. You can tell us, you can just say what's sí. happening in the picture. Díganos lo que ve en la foto. Ah, allí estoy yo a la parte de él, pero este no sale en la otra parte. I was sitting with him in that picture. I'm not in the picture. La mano que está ahí es la mía. My hand is holding him. Let's see My the next hand. photo. Es en, en la casa donde vivía mi suegra, estábamos todos juntos porque había venido su hermano de El Salvador, el que está de camisa okay. uh, anaranjada. The person that is wearing an orange um, t-shirt is my William's brother that was just arriving from El Salvador. So that's in my mother's in-law house and we were celebrating the arrival of my brother-in-law. And? ¿Qué es esto? Sí, ese es un día cuando fue un 14 de febrero. That was y él me dio flores como todos los años, siempre me daba flores y 
era muy atento conmigo, era el mejor. That was Valentine's Day. He was a oh. very, a very good uh, husband. He always gave me flowers. And this is William and Margarita again? Estos sí. son ustedes dos. Okay. Sí. Let's see the next one. Sí. And um, who is that? ¿Quién es son ellos? Who is that? It's me, my cousin, and my dad. <laughs> and we was hugging each other. And mom took that picture that time. Sounds like your dad really <laughs> loved his family. Is that right? He yeah. loved family. Yeah. And who is that? Who is that? Um, that's my grandma, my brother, and me, no, my no, mom, no. and my dad. And we took a picture together because um, my grandma came from El Salvador and we wanted a picture yeah. with her. Yeah. It's a wonderful picture. And what's that? What's and happening there? At that time was his birthday. The, the it was papa. And my dad's birthday and was celebrating his birthday. Wow. And and that, and that was my brother's graduation when he um passed kin um preschool. Right. And so he was there for him. That's wonderful. And that's when it was my um my it's cousin's just, my birthday. That's and, your birthday. Yeah, yeah, and my and my 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 dad is holding my cousin and we're celebrating my um birthday. And there we are at Raising Waters, and my dad is with my, with my brother. Sounds like you had a lot of fun with your dad. Yeah, and that's my cousin with my dad, and they're, um, they're happy that they're because they're both playing together. It's a wonderful photo. Yeah. It's a wonderful picture. And there it was Disneyland, and oh, wow. he always takes us to good places, so we went to Disneyland and yeah. last year. That last year, and this is. That's Lake Tahoe, and we're, and we're playing in the snow. Wow. And, and that we'll, one? That's church, when we, and a lot of people was in around him. Right. And they was like praying and singing wow. songs. Wow. So I ask this of all of you. There were people at the scene who saw what happened and who know who killed William. So if those people are watching this program, what is it you want to say to those people right now, if you could say anything to them, if they're, they, the ones that haven't come forward yet? Hay, había gente en la escena ese día cuando William fue, fue asesinado. Mucha gente. Por mucha. favor, si ustedes pueden decirle a esa gente algo, que diga algo para resolver este crimen, ¿qué le diría? Yo le diría a esos que dicen que eran sus amigos, que por favor digan a la policía la información que ellos tienen porque ellos son los principales testigos que ellos pueden eh, aclarecer esta dónde están esos culpables. I am asking please to the people that witnessed um, the uh, murder of my husband say something to the police. This is the only way we can clarify why he was dead. Why Señora was Sandoval. Alan. ¿Qué le podría decir, señora Sandoval, a la gente que sabe y no dice nada? Que por favor colaboren, porque no era un animal el que ha muerto. Ha muerto mi hijo, que era un gran hombre. No es porque sea mi hijo. Él era un buen padre, un buen hijo, un buen amigo, porque daba la vida por otro. Please, if somebody can say something, the person that is dead is my son. It's not just an animal that they kill. They kill a human being, an, um, an outstanding human being. Please say something. And Jocelyn. I will say, if you are the one who um, killed my dad, or saw who got, or saw him who got, who killed my dad, I will say, please, could you um, call because I love him a lot, and he's my dad, and I miss him so much. Thank you all for talking to us. I know this was very difficult for you. Lo siento mucho for your loss. Thank you. No one could say it better than these family members. Please, please make the call if you have any information about the murder of William Sandoval.
John Leonard is our second victim profile. Detective Luala Manga of the East Palo Alto Police Department has the background on this homicide. On July 18, 2008, at approximately 10.25 p.m. in the evening, East Palo Alto police officers were advised by San Mateo County Communications of reports of citizens reporting that a male subject had uh, suffered gunshot wounds in the vicinity of Ursula and Farrington Way. Upon police arrival, um, police discovered that the victim was 20-year-old John Leonard. Paramedics uh, shortly arrived after and attempted to render medical aid but were unable to revive uh, Mr. Leonard as he succumbed to his um, injuries. Further investigation revealed that Mr. Leonard may have uh, been contacted by two unknown male subjects prior to the shooting. Thereafter, after the shooting, uh, these two male subjects were last seen fleeing the scene in a light-colored vehicle. At this time, uh, there is no motive, at, there, there hasn't been a motive that's been determined for this tragic event at this time. It has not been determined. Thank you. Here with us to talk about John Leonard are some family members. His mother, Ms. Chapman, thank you for being here. One of his three sisters, uh, Nicole uh, Cheadle, thank you for being here. His, uh, John's companion, Satavia Meacham, thank you for being here. And she's here with John Leonard Jr., John's son, uh, who is 20 months old. And also here is Audrey Parker, who is John Leonard's godmother. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I know this is very, very difficult to talk about, but very, very important to talk about. So the first question I have to ask you all is, how did each of you learn about John's death? Ms. Chapman. I received a phone call um, from a long time Mommy. friend. I haven't talked to her very long, but she called and she told me that John was shot. And I asked her, was he all right? And she said, no, she think he was dead. So I just got in my car, some of the kids, and um, we lived in Newark at the time. So I drove over and just ran down Farrington, and I didn't get a chance to see him. He was covered up with a yellow cover. How did you find out? Well, I had just recently moved to Georgia. Um, John was actually taking care of my mom, which I was doing prior to that. So I moved to Georgia, and I was there maybe two weeks when I got the call from my oldest daughter that said that John had gotten shot, and they were en in, in route to the location where he was. And. Uh, Satavia, how did you find out? Um, well, I was with him all that day. Um, he had left to go. He said he'll be right back. He didn't exactly tell me where he was going, but he said he'd be right back. And uh, maybe about 15, 20 minutes later, maybe 20 minutes later, some a friend of ours uh, from the neighborhood he came uh, to my grandmother's house and he said, uh, they got John, they got John, he's gone. And I'm like, what do you mean they got John? You know, I didn't know what he was talking about. And I said, where is he? And they said, um, in Flutter. And I said, okay, like I hopped in the car. I, I got in a car with a, a friend of mine and I drove yeah. to the scene um, over on Ferriton. I didn't exactly know it was on Ferriton, but I followed the uh, fire trucks. Like when I was arriving, the firemen had just gotten there and uh, the police had just, they were putting up yellow tape, like cautions. And um, I ran towards the tape. 
I ran, I ran towards the uh, the tape, the yellow tape, and as like as I I ran towards him, he was laying on the ground, and I I blacked out and I fainted, like I blacked out. I didn't even get a chance to get close to him. I just was in shock and I blacked out. So how old are you? I'm 22. Miss Parker, you're his godmother. How did you uh, find out? I found out um, that day was my youngest son's birthday, and um, we was going to celebrate. We were all going to go to the Crab Shack, which was in Oakland, um, and I had made some tacos, and um, Johnny gave me some money earlier to go get the crab, because him and my other son had been drinking, and he was like, Mom, we're tipsy. So I went to go get the crab. And as I came home, one of my sons ran out the door screaming. And he said, Mom, John is gone. They shot John. And I said, where? Where is he? And he said, around the corner from my grandmother's house. And I just rushed over there. And when I got there, he was laying at the corner, and it was yellow tape. And Pastor Bennett was there, and my pastor, Pastor Harris, was there. And Satami and them all, and we just huddled. You know, we just well, we, held on to each other. We we have photographs of John showing some good times. But this has been very hard to talk about. And I'm hoping that as the photographs come up on the monitor, that you all can just tell, tell all of us what we're seeing and, and what was happening uh, during these times. We've got several photographs. So that's John. Is that right? Yes. That's and our favorite picture. Is that your favorite picture? Why is that? Because it's, it that's describes him. How, do you, how would you describe him? We'll go to the next picture. Go ahead. How would you describe him, Satavia? John Satavia. Um, that mama's boy. Yeah, yeah. that's mama. one of him and Linda. Mama's boy. He was very happy and cheerful. He was always like, I don't know, somewhat. How old was he in that picture? Of attention. Kind of. He was two. Two years old. Look at, look at, look at the picture. Wow. And that? Yeah. How old? He was five years old there. It's adorable. It's adorable. What's happening in that picture? I wanted a picture of all of my grandkids and kids together. And it's a wonderful picture. I was in the hospital and uh -huh. had my first surgery. I had uh -huh. a kidney removed. Wow. That's the picture. Wow. They took both. What's, what's happening there? I graduated from Bellhaven. Next grade, right? You know, at Bell Haven, ever since Head Start. Oh. And how, how about there? <laughs> in the church. We, we reside at Harmony Baptist mm -hmm. Church in Oakland. Wow. He was a junior deacon then. Got it. And there? Who are all those men? And his oh, his, his brother and uncles. Where, where is John in that picture? He's the one sitting with the father. arms. That was on Father's Day. Father's Day. Got it. Wow. And that? I okay. guess we got it. That's, Look, Daddy. That's John Daddy. Jr. and John Sr., right? Mm -hmm. Wow. He was so excited to be a dad. He was. Really? He couldn't wait. And that's Octavia, yeah. that's you? And, yeah, that's and John. me. And John. So he really wanted to be a dad. He, he couldn't wait. He was excited. John wanted really. to be a dad when we were like 15. 15. <laughs> he really? played the father role to really? all the kids. And what's there? Just having That's fun at the beach? That's me and him at the beach. <laughs> we were at the beach. He loved to go to the beach. That's him wow. at the beach. So somebody saw something when, he, when John was, was shot. And that somebody, or some, they're not talking. If that somebody is watching this program right now, this is your opportunity 
family members to say something to that person so we can get this murder solved. What do you have to say to that person or people? Ms. Chapman? Anyone. It's just anything. If it's one word. It's just so. Nicole? Um, I just would like to say that um, it, it could be something you think is so small, but it could help a whole lot. So if you would just take the time and make the call, you don't have to identify yourself. Just give us the information that you know to help the family. Thank you. Satavia? Um, I just would like some type of closure. Uh, just for them to come forward, you know, uh, or if someone knows something. I mean, it's devastating what I'm going through. And, and Audrey? I would just like to tell them that no matter what it is, if it's small, you know, just make the call. We already forgave you in our hearts, mm -hmm. and we know that God forgave you. So we just would like a closure because every day, it's not a day go by that we don't talk about them, that we don't think about them. And we just, we miss him so much. I just went, me and my boys just went and visited him on Sunday. Yeah. We just won't. Yeah. Where is he buried? In Livermore. Livermore. So I know that this has been we can just see it, how hard this has been for you all to talk about it, but you all had the courage to come forward, to come on this program, and to speak out. And that's what we need from you all. We need the people who know something to speak out. You know who you are. If you saw anything that has to do with the murder of John Leonard, please make the call. If you don't, then you let the person who killed John Leonard, get away with yet another murder in East Palo Alto, and nobody, none of us wants that. Thank you all for coming on Make the Call, and we hope that somebody out there will do that and make the call. That's 1-888-MURDER-0, 1-888-687-3370. Please make the call. Welcome back to Make the Call. I am your host, Ladaris Cordell. It is time now to hear from leaders in the faith community. It is my pleasure to bring together a group of individuals who are very active in the faith community in East Palo Alto. And starting from my right, we have with us Reverend Lawrence Goody. We have Pastor Viliami Teu. We have with us Marva Monhe, even though she's not a pastor, she is active with PIA, Peninsula Interfaith Action. Thank you for being here. Also, we have Pastor Joe Prado. Thank you. Thank you. And we have also Pastor Clifton Bennett, Pastor Andre Harris, and 
Pastor uh, Leah Willie. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we might as well just jump right into this conversation, and I do want this to be a conversation among us all. It seems to me that East Palo Alto is right now in a crisis of faith. Uh, it used to be that the church was a second home for our children and young people, a place where families came together. A church was a refuge for people in trouble. And I don't think that that's the case today. And, and I don't mean not just in East Palo Alto, but today it seems to me that it's all about, with many, many young people, it's all about thug worship. Uh, the connection between many of our young people and the faith community just doesn't seem to exist anymore. Uh, there are far more young people, I think, hanging out on the streets than there are hanging out in our churches. And I want to know if there is this disconnect. You know, what is the reason? What is behind this? Has the faith community dropped the ball? I want to start the conversation with Pastor Bennett. Well, uh, if I could speak to that issue uh, concerning um, definitely in the East Palo Alto, uh, East Menlo Park community with um, African American. Um, I believe a disconnect came uh, pretty much back in the early 80s. Um, there was uh, a crack epidemic that basically hit um, our cities. And uh, at this time, uh, parents abandoned children. And uh, children were left to uh, grandparents and great aunts and great uncles who pretty much had already gone through one or two generations with raising children. And they were pretty much tired. But those were our forefathers who kept the tradition alive of going to church. Uh, whether you uh, had a real commitment to Christ or not, you at least went to church and learned about God. Um, this disconnect did happen. Um, children were pretty much left uh, to the media, to TV, video games, which uh, pretty much helped to raise them. And, uh, sort and of this, like the babysitters. In a yeah, way. that became the babysitters. Uh, with the economy uh, putting pressures, a lot of parents had to work two and three jobs uh, that we even find out today. So uh, the disconnect comes from uh, pretty much the uh, academic now of, of the crack epidemic, whereby now um, two and three generations uh, have come from that, um, where uh, the children were left by themselves and they were, they were angry and then they went and they had babies. And now we're dealing with like a third or fourth generation from when that crack epidemic first hit our cities. So the disconnect uh, really comes from when uh, the tradition of going to church was lost mm -hmm. during that right. era. Well, Pastor, let me ask <coughs> Pastor Tate. Uh, we've heard Pastor, Rev Pastor Bennett talk about the disconnect, at least within the African American community. What about in the Tongan community? Is there a disconnect? Are young people not there? Well, it's the same as uh, uh, Pastor Bennett said. You know, with all young people, they get involved in uh, game, you know, video game and all those stuff, and become, a, like they say, it's a, become like a babysitter to them. When they grow up, like uh, our parents go and work two jobs, and they don't have enough uh, time to spend with them kids and the kids left mm. home without someone to look after them so mm. well let me ask Marva and as uh, Pastor Prado ha has the faith community dropped the ball in the Latino community at least with respect say to East Palo Alto in the Latino community um, we do see a disconnect and uh, our local church were very involved right now in reconnecting uh, the church back to the community. Uh, we have a group of uh, just high school kids over 85 that are very active in our in our church. Uh, we we sponsor an annual youth camp for them. Uh, in fact, uh, in August we just finished a camp. We had over we had what I think it was like 87 young people that we took to camp. Um, we have every Thursday we have a mentorship program for the kids, and. Uh, you know, so we're trying to rekindle that connection. Uh, so you agree that, I mean, there is a disconnect. Do you agree, Marva, in, in the Latino community? 
I think in the Latino community, there's a disconnect, but it also depends who you're talking to. Because some families have been able to maintain their faith values very strong, be able to um, be able to do it. And I, and I know it from personal experience, just by seeing different families that I know. I know with our family personally, there was a disconnect with the church. And we, for us, you know, our religion was, you know, it was something kind of in the far in the way, in the distance. You know, you went to mass every once in a while um, because both my parents worked. My parents had two jobs. They had to, you know, they had six children. They had, you know, we lived with another fa with um, another family members. Um, with so you have when you have multiple families living together in the same home, you know, there's a lot of struggles. You know, you they rely on the aunt and the uncle like they did back in their countries to take care of the children. Well, sometimes you know, they're not. They're afraid to discipline the children at home um, because things are done a little bit different. In the, in the U.S. as they will be mm -hmm. done, you know, if right. you come from Latin America, right. the setting is very different. Right. So it feels like that this disconnect, I mean, it's similar in these various communities. What about in the Samoan community, Pastor Willie? Well, let me tell you, with the Samoan community, uh, is there a disconnect? <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to say, and let me tell you why. It's because we are, as, as a Samoan community, as what we all said here, if there is a disconnect, then we need to connect back. And how do we reconnect if there's a disconnect? The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, and, and the thing that we're trying to do in the Samoan community is kind of like talk to the parents. We have made up parent groups to where parents can interact with their children uh, and also then the, the children uh, can so forth take that advice from parents. Because there are times when parents talk to a level to a child where a child cannot understand, you see. And so when you come to a level of a child, not know, knowing that you're a father, you're a mother, but then you're also trying to connect to that child as saying, listen, I've been there, I've done that, I went that route, mm -hmm. I've chosen it, and it's not a good route. So you kind of give that warning ahead of time. So, like all of these pastors have said, they're totally right. Yeah. There is a disconnect, but how do we reconnect? Right. So Pastor Harris, this, this notion that Pastor Willie talked about, about, you know, been there, uh, I've experienced it, so you need to listen to me. Is there any, do you believe that? Do you believe in that? I do, you know, but <clears throat> if I can just hit on the disconnect Go point, right what ahead. happened was is that uh, we started giving them choices. Mm. That's where it came. <laughs> we said, we don't want to parent them like my parents parented me. And we started allowing the kids to make choices. Okay, Sunday morning, you can kick back and watch cartoons <laughs> instead of coming to church. That's where the disconnect came. <clears throat> it came again, too, because the churches are so traditional. Mm. They don't want to change. This is 2009, and we still want to have church like it's 1960. It's like a turnoff to younger people. And it turns them saying? off because they're coming to churches walking on eggshells. You know, you're telling them that you have to dress a certain way. Sure, we want them. You, we, we want people to be an adult when they're a child. Right. So that's what happened. Oh, also, if I, oh, let, let, let me okay. finish this point. Even, even, even on the experience, you know, um, I'm, I'm a formerly incarcerated person. I was released from Pelican Bay State Prison in 1989. So our church may be, our church is not affected like most churches. Um, 60% of our church is made up of people between the age of 18 to 40. So all the young folk come to our church. Why do they come there? Because we allow them uh, to come there and be themselves. You come to church to get blessed by God, not to be dressed up by somebody. And that's the problem with the churches. We have to go out and, 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 and get to know them. We have to go out and we have to know them by name, uh, get to know their families, get to know, you know, the background, where they all come from. And, and, and that's what the churches is lacking. That's why nobody is coming to the churches. Yeah, We've commercialized. Bennett, Pastor Bennett, you were saying. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to um, dropping the ball, you mm -hmm. know. I think the faith <clears throat> community um, has always been there, but the way that we do church and the way that we do ministry has changed drastically with the generation of youth that we have now. Um, uh, the generation that we're dealing with now does not respect you because of your title. Uh, they respect you because of your work. 
uh, what they see you do, what they see you do in the streets. If they see you, you know, able to take the tie off and maybe put on some jeans and tennis shoes and go out there, throw a ball with them, talk to them on the corner. So, you know, the way that we used to do church and the, and the, the respect that we just wanted because of our title no longer exists. And, you know, maybe about 60 to 65 percent of the churches in our community um, are pretty much still ran by, um, you know, tradition, a lot of our forefathers, what they what they set in motion. And uh, I think a change is coming because we're realizing in, in this day and time that you have to have um, a pretty um, diverse venue uh, for uh, our youth today. You know, holy hip hop, you know, uh, something like the uh, Tayak Teenagers and Young Adult Cafe. You have to have some different flavor. Otherwise, uh, you ain't gonna miss them. You gotta be, you gotta be able to leave your four walls of comfort and go out there and So do you all agree? I mean, is, is tradition the problem, that, that the church is so traditional and that's why we're losing all these young people, Reverend Goody? I, I don't really agree with that, but I, I mean, I, th I, I had a, talking about disconnect, though I did have a, a funeral. We've, we've had probably more, th more funerals in our church than any of the churches, and there was one funeral I remember. I knew the mother, the father, the grandfather, the aunts, uncles, and all the adults in the family, except for the this young man and his friends, and I saw them at the funeral. And uh, but it, I, I think, I think it's bigger than how we do our services. I think it reaches, it goes deeper to, you know, being concerned for them. I think uh, uh, Doug Ford said something about when people come out of prison, we've got to be ready to walk with them. And I think that that's something that all the churches can do without changing their tradition. I think. You know, to to be able to to walk with them, make sure that they do what they're supposed to do, so they don't end back where they were. Because I think this is one of the problems. When I mean, they're on the radar screen, it's, it's time for us to really be walk with them, to be with them, to show that we are concerned. I, I had one young man I was trying to follow, and he showed up uh, last night, and I said, "Okay, come," or the day before last, and I said, "Come, come, we're going to talk tomorrow." He never showed up, you know trying to get a phone number, trying to get an address so I could follow up on him. You know, but I think that's the kind of thing we can do. And, and the churches are connected. That's one thing. We need, there may be a disconnect between the young people, but we are... Do, I, you, I all, do you all talk to each other? Yeah, well, I know do, do just you, about everybody here. Do, do in this room. Actually, actually, there's a disconnect amongst the churches. There's a disconnect. There, so here there's there a connect is. and a disconnect. There is, so why do you say there's a disconnect? The African-American <laughs> church, due to, due to denominationalism, due to uh, uh, your uh, ethnic background. The churches are not together. If, if I could go back, with these kids, because I know this, this is make the call, we have to go inside. We have to go inside the prisons. We can't wait for them to come home. We have to go out on the street corner. There is, a, there is so, such a separation. Our church, we do everything in our church. We feed, we house. Um, I, I've, I've been involved in most of the funerals. The only reason we don't do most of the funerals is because our church is not big enough. Um, I go to the jails. I cry with them. I'm, I'm out there uh, when the murders happen uh, because the family calls me. The community calls me. Well, let me go back to something you said, though. If, if then indeed the churches are not connected, one, should they, should you all be somehow connected? And if so, why? Why is that important? I've never been, I've been in... Ten different communities. I, I'm not from here. I didn't grow up in the streets, but I've been in ten different churches in 45 years. I've never been anywhere where the the, the churches have been so united. And uh, we have a PO. There's just a, there's which Marva works with is is like uh, I think there are three churches that are involved in PIA. They're training our people to be leaders, um, but also a fellowship of faith, which uh, mm -hmm. it, it includes I don't know how many churches, but a lot of churches. And we're, we, we passed Measure C to raise money right. from the taxes in order to be able to work with work on programs for, right. for uh, crime in the street. I mean, I, I think it's important that you all talk to one another. But yeah. I will tell you, I will just tell you that, I mean, maybe it's because I'm old, but I'm, I'm really tired of all the talking. And right. I th I'm willing to bet that most of the people who are watching this program are tired of all the talk. And what people want to know is they want to see action. They want to see, you know, particularly the faith community. What are you doing 
that's concrete, that's out there connecting with young people because clearly when you do that, perhaps the violence is gonna, gonna cease or at least be reduced. So I throw it out to you all. Um, what are you doing? What, is, what, is your, what are your respective faith communities doing? Are you stepping up to deal with this issue of violence in our community with young people? And if so, what are you doing? Well, um, I'll yield to you. Thank Go ahead, you. Pastor Prado. I'm new here in the community of East Palo Alto. And what Pastor Father Gooding just said about pastors being together in the community, I'll tell you, I was in Washington State for seven years. And uh, coming to East Palo Alto, I haven't seen a community so united as far as pastors coming together. Uh, you know, we all here belong you to the fellowship. Here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Tonight, but we meet, we meet monthly uh, with the Fellowship of Faith, and, and these issues are, are brought out. So I feel that we are a community that's coming together. I feel that churches are coming together, pastors are coming to get t together, and that's why we're here. But what are you doing out of the community? I mean, there's, there are, you know, young people out there right. dealing drugs on the street. Should you be doing anything well, about that? Well, what? yeah, we, we are. are um, I think first we have to realize that, um, you know, every pastor, um, though he pastors, not, might not be called to the venue of the prison, uh, mm -hmm. might not even be young enough to to get out in the streets and, and walk the streets. Um, so I think God is raising up um, a generation of pastors that are young, have that experience where they can go into the jail cells, have the experience where, you know, I've sold drugs before, I know what you're doing, man, I've been there. You know, low ride and selling drugs, mm -hmm. been on a cone, I know what you're doing. You know, we, we have now some that are raising up that have that experience. But if you was to ask uh, what we're doing, well, we've left our pool pit, gone back into the high schools, uh, gave our time in the high schools, working with uh, kids to help with the uh, um, high school uh, incompletion rate in, in our city. So we've gone, we've gone that way. We have venues now to where we have a uh, holy hip hop. We bring mm -hmm. in gospel rapping. Uh, artists who are able to, you know, give free concerts and, and allow those that are out there who have uh, talents to come on the stage and come on, we give you an open mic, but we want you to be positive. Don't tear down nobody. We've, uh, we've gone to the extent to where we have um, uh, the, uh, the TAYAC, which we call Teenagers and Young Adult Cafe. A cafe setting is where you come in, you feed them free some smoothies and uh, chili fries and have an open mic and you'd be surprised at the talent that's out there. We've had everything from ballet to, to singing to comedy, but they need alternatives. And I mm -hmm. think the young pastors uh, within our city and even some of our older pastors who realize I might not have the strength and the bandwidth, but I'm willing to open up my doors and allow you to come. Pastor Willett, what about Miss Simone community? Well, the Simone community, let me tell you, I, I am ministering in my pulpit and reaching out to the parents and so forth, the parents will reach out to their children. I think that's the number one basic fundamental is parents reaching out to their children. So therefore, uh, the, 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 the children will not be influenced regardless of what they're doing out there in the streets. So you're working on the parenting skills. Right. And so, I mean, that's the bottom line. Now, parents cannot do everything. Now, the thing is this, is that we need to work as a community. It's not only faith-based community right. that can actually, you know, solve this problem. This problem will never be solved because we live in a world that's corrupt. Mm -hmm. We can only calm the matter down and hopefully God can react and do something about this. But he is. But what we're doing is we're praying, we're going out there and doing what we're supposed to do as pastor, leaving our pulpit. And, of course, like you said, we need actions because action speaks louder than than work. Yeah. You know, we, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still somewhat confused. I've been in East Palo Alto all my life, in Menlo Park, 53 years. Uh, my parents came there in 1952. Uh, they named them Netter Harris Community Center after my mom. Uh, my dad started the first health center, Charles Lou Health Center. I've seen the transition of how the community have changed. Mm -hmm. I'm still questioning the churches being together. We have to literally go out on the street corners. You know, we bring the kids into the church. I mean, we bring uh, the ones that are involved in drug selling, the violence, you name it. We have them there, focus groups or what have you. Um, the issue right now, here, here's the issue, is building the family. Mm -hmm. It's building the family. That's what Pastor Willie was saying. Building the about. family. That's you hit right. the nail right That's on the right. head. Because here's the problem. The churches uh, 
uh, pastors, what have you, are only going to be able to do so much. But it's going to start in the home, mm. building the family. That's what's going to impact all the violence in the community. Okay. Because right now, it, it has to be more where we've gotten to. Instead of it being a calling, people have turned it into a profession. So Pastor Ted, do you agree? Is it all about the family and yes. faith community doing work with the family? Mm -hmm. uh, we share with the, with the parents, like uh, Pastor Willie, uh, so they can teach their kids, you know. If they don't do it, we will do it. And if we, we can't do it, the Lord will do it, see? Mm -hmm. And uh, we share with them mm -hmm. and give them the option, the, <clears throat> the way they should go, and it's up to them, you know, because we can't force anybody. So Monhe and, and uh, it's Ms. Monhe and uh, Pastor Prado, is it the same in the Latino community? Family, family, that's, the, that's where the faith community should be focused? Well, as Latinos, uh, we focus on the, his, on, 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 the, uh, on the household. One of the challenges that we have in, uh, as pastor, uh, this is a challenge that, that I confront, we have a lot of single uh, families. What do you mean single, single families? Single parents. Single, single parents. parents? Uh, we have a lot. You mean usually moms? Moms. Uh, I've got some, some uh, single fathers at, at the church and in the community that we're reaching out to. You know, so... Um, that's, you know, that's a challenge for us because here, you know, sometimes you've got a mother that's got three kids, there's, there's not a father there, there's not that male role model, right. you know, and, and that's where the church comes in, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's an area that we're very busy with. For example, uh, we, you know, we provide food for them. Some of these mothers, they can, you know, they, they can't afford food and, and, and as a church, uh, we, have a, we have a program to help them. And uh, these are the challenges that we confront. Right. You agree? I, I agree that um, with, with, with all the other pastors said, I mean, you do have to start with the families. I, I look at it as if, if you don't have a strong foundation at home, then you really are, you're re you know, the wind blows too hard, that, you know, the food's going to get knocked out or it's not going to grow properly. Um, I think it's, it has to start from the families. I think um, as parents, we have to take responsibility for our share. Um, and not depend everything on the church. Um, but I think there's a lot that the church can do for us. I think the churches are working really hard um, and be able to provide more services to, um, to our communities. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's more, I believe there's more, in, um, more programs for our youth for, um, at, like at our church, there's now a boys club, you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't there, you know, a few years back before Fa um, Father Goody got there. You know, because we and it was, a lot of boys are being affected. A lot. I have th three brothers, and they're all very different. They all took very different paths, and for me, it's it. You know, it's really hard to say. Well, there's you know, you have to blame the family for it because they're not raising their children properly. It's not they're it's not they're they're not raising their children properly for lack of not caring because they're not a single parent out there that doesn't want the best for their kid. I mean, I, I think we should avoid the blame game. I mean, mm -hmm. saying is, and there are all mm -hmm. forces but out there that affect everything. But let me ask you one final question, everyone. How will you know when you have succeeded? How, what, what will be the markers? How will we know that you're you know, doing what you do, working with the parents, going out, you know, ministering? How will, what, how will we know well, if you, we've succeeded? It's, it's, a long, <laughs> it's a long journey. This is not a... a it's not a profession for a short time. Uh, in other words, uh, I believe uh, Pastor Harris said this is not a destination but a journey. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, um, we, we mark success by lives being changed. When we see lives change, we see young men come off the street. Uh, we produce leaders. We send them to leaders conferences and they come back leaders inspired, ready to go and inspiring the next young person because youth begat youth. Um, I do believe um, that a child left himself bringing his mother to shame. We do need to uh, target the families, but we deal with a lot of um, single parenting, like you said, um, and a lot of uh, homes that's just incomplete. And I think that's where the faith community definitely yeah. comes in. I, I think this, you know what, we got to take it one step at a time. You know, and not everybody is going to be won over to change. Mm -hmm. But if we change one, mm -hmm. that's going to make a difference throughout the whole community. And we take that one and we shelter it and we build it up, we water it, 
and so forth, you know what? The rest is going to follow along. I agree. And, we, and we you know, take it one step and at what a else? time. The other thing that will make a difference in this community is if the faith community encourages those out there to make the call, to step That's up right. and have the courage do your part. to pick up the That's phone, right. do your part, to and pick up the phone call. and make the call. Right. I, I thank all of you for coming on this program. I thank you for taking the lead in bringing back faith in the community and, and making this reconnect happen. And I hope that you will encourage members of your respective communities to step up and to make, <coughs> and to make the call. So I thank all of you. Pleasure be, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close, let's take a look at the seven murder victims profiled thus far on Make the Call. On March 20th, 2009, William Sandoval, an East Palo Alto resident, was killed by someone who shot into a crowd at a party in the 2200 block of Addison Avenue. On July 18, 2008, John Leonard, a 20-year-old Milpitas resident, was found shot in the area of Ursula Way and Farrington Way and died at the scene. On September 22, 2008, Michael Eugene Booker was fatally injured by gunfire from a passing bicyclist while sitting in his car at 137 Holland Street in East Palo Alto. On October 20, 2007, Aaron LaTorrance Dennis was brought to the intersection of Xavier Street and Purdue Avenue in East Palo Alto in a light-colored SUV where he was shot and killed. On September 4, 2007, Jamel Little was shot and killed while standing on the sidewalk at the 100 block of Alzalea Drive. On January 22, 2007, Seema Singh, 18 years old, was shot and killed while driving her vehicle in the 900 block of Alberni Street. On December 20, 2006, at 9.12 p.m., John Farmer, owner of the Doctor's Sports Bar, was fatally injured by gunfire inside the business located at 2240 University Avenue in East Palo Alto. Remember, if you know something and do nothing, you're helping a murderer. Help a grieving family instead. Make the call. 1-888-MURDER-0. That's 1-888-687-3370. I'm Ladaris Cordell. Thanks for watching. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid. We praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police. It's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid, we praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. Make the call. No one should get away with murder.